I'm Masood Haq, and I thank you very much for coming. This is the first public showing of this film. Um, I am very proud of this film. I see a lot of the people who are in the film are sitting right here, and it's a pleasure to see them and, and view this film again with them. Um, I j want to just uh, say thank you to Media Sanctuary. Um, this is a difficult film for people to show. Politically, it's kind of radioactive. And I want to thank Brandon Miller and Steve Pierce for um, supporting the film. I want to uh, especially thank Sina um, Vasela Hickey, who did such an ace job in promoting the film. And I want to thank Jean Finley. She has helped me in so many different ways throughout this film. Um, I'm surprised she hasn't asked me for a producer's credit yet. <laughs> All right. Um, I hope you find this film useful and, and worth your time. And I thank you for coming. I want to thank the Sanctuary for Independent Media for showing this really important film this evening and giving us the opportunity to further discuss the movie. First, I'm going to introduce the panelists. Um, and after introductions, I'm going to begin the discussion by asking each panelist a question. Uh, then we'll take questions from the audience. And when you, um, at that time, you can line up. The, the microphone is over there, and people can line up to ask questions. Um, and afterwards, um, is Mel here, or did she walk out? Mel's in the back, waving her hand in the back. And um, since there are more cases like this in the United States, unfortunately, Mel has the uh, sign-up sheet for the Coalition for Civil Freedoms, which works with uh, people who are wrongfully prosecuted, such as in this case. Uh, first, hello, my name is Lynn Jackson. I've lived in Albany for five decades. I volunteer with Save the Pine Bush, and I became involved in the Aref Hossein case in 2007 because I was simply shocked that our government targeted these two men simply because of their religion. I would like to introduce the filmmaker, Masood Haq, is a physician and a filmmaker. After completing undergraduate studies at New York University, her, he pursued medicine and became a board-certified emergency physician. In 2007, he received an MFA in documentary film production from the City University of New York. He produced and directed several award-winning short documentaries, including Stranger in Paradise, which won the top prize at City Vision Film Festival and the jury prize at the Jackson Heights Film Festival. Witness is his first documentary feature. Um, next, I would like to introduce Kathy Manley. Kathy is a criminal defense attorney, speaking as Yassin Aref's attorney. She is the legal director of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. Just a reminder, the table's in the back. Um, and the president of the Capital Region Council of the New York Civil Liberties Union. She is also a founding member of Project Salam. Her main emphasis is criminal defense and constitutional rights. She concentrates on appeals, has written many winning briefs before a variety of courts, and has received several awards for her work. Larry Rulison has been a reporter for the Albany Times Union since 2005. Larry's reporting for the Times Union has won several awards for business and investigative journalism from the New York State Associated Press Association and the New York News Publishers Association. As a journalist, he has written about the informant, Shahid Hussein, the 2000 Schoharie limousine crash, and the connection between those two cases. So I would like to start out with the first series of questions. Um, I'd like to start with Masood, and the first question is, Witness was 11 years in the making. How do you think the perspective of the present day, it's all over instead of it's still in progress, has added to the film? Well, um, 
I think just the very idea that this film took so long to make uh, on the surface may seem like a, a problematic thing, but um, in retrospect, I think it's one of the best things that could have happened to the film. Uh, it's because it gives you a layered understanding of where this country is in terms of uh, Islamophobia and where these people are. Um, you saw Allah, who's Yasin's daughter. She's, uh, she was in high school when I interviewed her. And to see her as a grown woman here now, it just it, 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 it gives it a, a layer for me, a texture for me that I think a straightforward documentary uh, could have never had. Um, you, th this film is, is in, in many ways is, is politically toxic because it takes two characters who were convicted by a jury and it advocates for those characters and, and, and says that things are not um, what they seem. As far as Muslims in this country are concerned, things are also not what they seem. Um, we may not be in the headlines for terrorism related cases, but the infrastructure that was placed by George Bush and, and, and uh, his uh, uh, Homeland Security is still very much there. You, you, it, there are no other people in this country who can be pulled out of uh, a lineup uh, or, or pulled out of uh, waiting to get into the plane or, or, or to get their ticket and be told they're going to be body searched. There's just, it, it, is, it is such a delusion to think that this is not happening because only the, it, it's only to people like us that it happens and it has become so routine for us that we don't even complain about it anymore. Uh, I'm a 57 year old doctor. I, I come back from a country and, and they can just question me as long as they want to. They can go through my luggage without my permission. So, so, so I think this is a reminder that, that, that this country uh, may have made some progress, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have another question for you. Huh? Um, who is the witness in the movie? So thank you for asking that question. <laughs> so witness and literally is Yasin Arif is a witness, but it's also history that is witness. This, this, this film um, it, it takes a, a particular story in, in, in a particular time in American history and, and we all bear witness to, to that history. Uh, we, we have uh, seen how um, fear can um, eat your soul and um, in this country it did for a long time. Um, and um, this film is a witness, and the audience who see it are, are witness, and uh, so it's, it has uh, several meanings. So we're all the witnesses. You're all witnesses. <laughs> all witnesses. Thank you. Um, Kathy, uh, could you describe some of the main legal issues raised by the case that are still in operation today? Huh, yeah. Secret evidence, secret evidence, fear against Muslims, secret evidence, the flipping of the presumption of innocence. But, but I just want to say that um, I remember, you know, I was there in 2004 when Yassin was arrested and I was working for Terry Kinlan and I remember the lie about the commander and how we showed that that was false and because it had to be presented to us and the judge let Yassin go. And right after that was when the government invoked the Classified Information Procedures Act, like I said in the movie, and they started giving the judge all this classified information that could have been just the kind of same thing that they did with the lies with Commander. We don't know. To this day, we haven't seen it. So one thing that wasn't totally clear from the movie was that Terry Kinlan and Kevin Louis Brand got those security clearances, and they got shown almost nothing, just meaningless gibberish. But that was because they only would, the judge would have to decide what to give them. And the legal standard for what they were given was that the material had to be considered by the judge favorable to the defense. So if the judge had been told that Yassin was a terrorist commander, according to this document, that he wasn't translating, right? He would not have given that to the defense because that was not favorable. The Sixth Amendment gives you the right to confront the evidence against you and to show that it's false in this case, right? We showed it was false when they gave it to us, but ever since then they didn't give us anything and they didn't give it to Terry and they didn't give it to Kevin. And I'm still really angry about it because right today, this very day, I'm caught in another case involving the same kind of secret evidence. It's gotten worse since then. I'm sorry it hasn't gotten better. It's gotten worse. We had a secret order in a case I filed in Texas just today, yesterday, court, when I called the court to say, what did the court do in my case for my client? The 
deputy clerk said, I can't tell you anything, you'll have to ask the government. And it's still going on, we're filing an emergency motion probably tomorrow. So um, pretty upset about that, but um, so yeah, secret evidence. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of other legal issues I could get into, but we'll leave it at that. Secret evidence convicts innocent people. Thank you very much, Kathy. Unfortunately, this is still going on today. And um, Larry, how do you think the presence of Shahid Hussein in the Sting cases and the ones that we know of are Araf Hussein, the Newburgh Four, the Pittsburgh Khalifa al Akili case, and as a shadow owner of the limousine company whose vehicle crashed in Schoharie affected the limousine case? Mm. Well, um, the, uh, I think it made the lim it, it made, it instantly made the public have doubts about the limousine case, right? Because looking back, anything um, Shahed Hussein was involved in, in these two, the, the, well, the two trial cases that we know of, and then the others, we know that he was protected by the government. And so that, that there was this assumption that something was going wrong too with the limo case, and so it became this, well, how is the government involved? How is the FBI involved? Is, is this all happening again? And so, I mean, that's unfortunately, made, was one of the dynamics that made the story compelling. The, the, I mean, the limo crash was horrific in itself, just the fact that a crash like that happened and you know, all the neglect and everything, but I mean, we'll, we probably will never be able to stop wondering, because I doubt this FBI, um, you know, review of the case is going to come to anything because um, it, I just there's no you, way. You, you don't think the FBI's internal review of this <laughs> yeah, is going to produce, yeah. you know, like a report that explains what happened or anything? I, I mean, I'm <laughs> expecting it, like in the, the documentary when. Um, uh, 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 Terry Kinlan shows the order or the of like and it's blank. So you think we'll get blank paper? <laughs> Today we didn't even know there was an order. We had to uh, like here's the report and you look at it and it's nothing. That's I mean that's what I imagine. Thank you very much. Do we have some questions from the audience? But if you do, you can come up here and use the microphone. No, no questions from the audience yet? We have There's somebody coming over there. Oh. Now, the question that I have is that, you know, these cases are long over. Uh, <clears throat> these people have been released. This is something that goes on forever, the Dreyfus case End of, the, uh, 19, end, of the, end of the 1800s had secret evidence that convicted a Jew in Catholic France. He was a German agent. Does this secret evidence remain secret forever and why? And why isn't it demanded now? United States taxpayers wasted a lot of money in incarcerating these two guys. We fought, we fought it as hard as we possibly could, and we got absolutely nowhere. The, sec the Second Circuit Court of Appeals was given secret evidence that even the local prosecutors weren't able to see, and they were given a secret argument that we were all kicked out of the courtroom to hear, and then they decided in like a few short pages that all of our hundreds of pages of arguments were just invalid without explaining why. They got the facts wrong, they got the law wrong. They based their decision on secret evidence, and. I don't know if they'll ever give us that evidence. Maybe in a hundred years it'll come out. Who knows? Can I say something about that? Uh, I think the secret evidence in this case is bullshit. That's what the secret evidence is. Because if they had something on him, they would have brought it. Oh, right? totally, totally. They, so, so I even question 
that piece of paper, where it came from, because they, they monitored him for two years. They monitored him. They monitored his calls. They knew where he was. The, the reason he came into their attention is because they had figured out that he worked for this organization, and he had called a number in Soleimania, which was affiliated with, with the organization that they thought was connected to terrorism. So this, this to me, uh, I don't have any faith in the FBI. I, I do not believe that it, that it did the right thing. I think they can manufacture evidence. And I, I truly believe that they had nothing else on him. There was nothing else that they had on, because if they did, they would have brought it, because they almost lost this case. Yeah, I've always believed that. Uh, John? Yes. Uh, I'm kind of wondering about your own fear factor in being uh, surveilled by the uh, FBI uh, in doing all the investigative and, and legal work uh, you've done. That's for you. For Probably for all Is of it? us. Um, <laughs> I was a little scared the other day with this case I'm in right now, just because there were weird things that they were trying to play mind games with me. Like I go into the elevator in New York City and there was a case in Texas and a case in New York with the same case. I'm not gonna even go into that, but I was in New York last Tuesday and I get into an elevator in this huge courtroom that go up to the 21st floor and this guy gets in the elevator and goes, Kathy Manley, and I'm like, Okay, he's trying to play games with me. They were following me around the courthouse. They maybe Googled me. Just, but I'm not really afraid. If I was Muslim, I'd probably be more afraid. Or if I was black, or I feel like, and, and I'm a little bit protected by being white and being a lawyer. Um, I didn't really protect Lynn Stewart, who's one of my role models, who went to prison for just speaking up for her client. But um, I, the, really, the fear kind of just makes me more angry and I just fight harder, <laughs> I don't know. I was, I was also wondering, now that you know, the film presents a very coherent um, explanation and documentation of a completely unbelievable uh, case and courtroom proceedings. And w one of the things that I don't understand is there seems to be an element of thought control and uh, it is confusing to me that um, so many people can so easily be manipulated and or lack integrity. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's any insight that you've gained over that. But if you look at American history, this is, this is a recurrent theme. This, this is not, it just happened to Muslims 20 years ago. It happened to the Japanese before that. It happened to the Chinese before that. We are a society that seems to thrive on, on uh, making others, you know, you're the other and I am the real American. And so, I, I mean, I think that this fits into the, the, the pattern of American history. Each minority has had to fight for their place in this society. I think Muslims are still fighting for that place. They haven't gotten there yet. Um, but, you know, to me, it's just not a surprise. I was thinking, though, I mean, like in terms of the judge, for example, um, proceeding in a way that seems to defy uh, any legal understanding law or, or rights, uh, you know, but like you the right. But the moment in history, that moment in history, everybody was scared. And fear was used very effectively by government organizations. They used fear, I mean, they, they weaponized fear. And that's why the judge was afraid. The jury was afraid. If you, if you heard, the, there was an interview that's not in the film, um, but the, the jury was concerned that they, if they let him go and he did something, what would happen? You know, so I mean, I think this is, this is not, unfortunately, the exception is the rule. I think the FBI controlled the mind of the judge by yes. feeding him that secret evidence. And, and that combined with this fear that he already had. Hi, so uh, I have two questions. I think it kind of goes unsaid, but this was a really heartbreaking and shocking film. And it kind of reminds me of what my parents told me about in that time in history in the United States, like people's husbands would go missing. And it was a very fearful time. Um, my first question is, as soon as I saw this, you know, I want to tell everyone about it. I would really love for as many people to see as possible. And I go to nearby university, so like, if you're comfortable like uh, doing another showing, I would love to have it shown at my university. Uh, second question is, when you first heard about this case, what was the moment you knew it had to be a film? Like, what was that process? 
Um, uh, yes, please organize a showing because no one else wants, <laughs> seems to want to see this film, so I'd be happy to be part of it. I have a website for the film, witnessdoc.com, and it will have the, the showings that are coming up, and there's a lot of information about the case as well. Um, I, I think the moment I knew that this would be a film is, is the moment I actually sat down and I began to read about what was happening. And, and I had a much more critical eye because of who I am as a minority in this, in this culture, and I understood these men, you know, and I keep saying that I, I could be Hussein, I could be Yasin, that, you know, it, this could have happened to me. And, and because it was so personal at that moment, uh, I, I knew that I had to do it. Hi. So a moment that really struck me in the film was um, after, I guess, the conviction happened, the FBI were being extremely evasive to like the reporter's questions. And I feel like the questions were super simple and straightforward. And I think like, I, I guess I understood them as to be as at the heart of the trial. So I'm just kind of confused as of how like they were able to be that evasive. And also, I don't know, like I guess how did they win the trial while also not being able to answer those questions directly? And am I misunderstanding the trial? No, no, it was a combination of the fear and the fact that the judge told the jury that there were good and valid reasons to go after Yassin and, and by extension Mohammed. You know, it was um, just, you know, and that was based on secret evidence. Then the jury was afraid to acquit him, even though they actually acquitted Yassin of most all the counts. He was found guilty of the first count. He was acquitted of like three quarters of the counts. Um, so they did see the weakness of the evidence, but they were afraid to completely acquit him. And um, what was the other, oh, how did um, I guess the like, FBI, yeah. I mean, it just showed that, that press conference and how they were being evasive. It just showed that they were really basing it on a preemptive model, like Steve was explaining, Steve Downs was explaining in the movie, that they didn't have any evidence, really. They had a lot of, like, maybe stuff that looked like smoke, but it wasn't even really smoke, let alone fire, right? And when you look at it more closely, it's nothing, like that commander stuff. And we could have like disproven all those things that were swirling around in the background, but it was secret evidence. We weren't allowed to talk about it in the trial. We weren't allowed to question them about it. So, um, But they were just afraid that maybe Yassin might do something in the future, and so we gotta really go after him now. And no matter how, how unfair it is, um, if he's innocent, too bad, we don't care. And that's something that's happened in a lot of cases where they just target somebody, set them up in a sting operation or sometimes other unfair tactics, and then put them away for a long time in prison mm -hmm. and destroy them, destroy their family, strike fear into the entire Muslim community, and then say, well, you know, if there's a 1% chance that that person might have someday be a terrorist, then that's what we have to do to prevent another 9-11. And they just don't care about all the destruction that's based on their completely irrational fear. I would say to you that one of the strategies for the FBI, uh, in this case and perhaps nationally, is to push false narratives and push them very early on. Uh, and, and they did that, and they used uh, local news stations to push that agenda forward. Um, I have a clip from one of the newspaper reporters who's talking to the, the anchorman, and, and he said th the FBI had been speaking to them. They had been feeding them information about just before the, the, the initial appearance that, that these guys are, are part of uh, Ansar al-Islam. You're going to find out information about this, and you're going to get, he, they, there's this connection, there's terrorist connection. When they very well knew this was a money laundering scheme, that they were trying to get these people on. So, so they were lying throughout, and up until the very end, they, 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 they were not being truthful. Well, there, there's one other lie that I wanted to mention that Steve kind of rebutted early on in the case where they said that Yassin said in his diary that he had a plan, plan in America, and they said, oh my God, that means he's a sleeper cell, he's gonna come here and do something. What really, when that was translated correctly, he was talking about America's plan to remove Saddam, how America was supporting the IMK and paying for this to try to go after Saddam, that they passed it by Congress, the Iraqi Liberation Act in 1998, that, that was paying for the IMK. That's what he was talking about in there. So this, that's the kind of stuff that they did over and over. And, and they also, they, 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 they purposefully made this case so complicated, right? And, and, and for James Comey, 
who is, who is such a choir boy, right? He he's always tells the truth. <laughs> For him to stand there and say that the, the inform, that Mohammed Hussein uh, approached the informant, yeah. it, is, yeah. it is such mm -hmm. a clear cut lie because it is at the entire basis of the case. Was it an entrapment or wasn't it? You sent somebody in. So for you to lie about it and say, no, he approached that person, I think it's such a fundamental, uh, fundamental dishonesty. It's unbelievable that, that, that they could get away with it. I'm afraid they can get away with it still. And I guess with that being said, how is it, I, I know that it was mentioned that the, both their appeals were lost. Um, I don't know, like I guess it's just so inflammatory seeing all like the actual facts of the case and how little evidence that they have and all of that. I, how were the appeals lost or I guess what went into that? But, like, yeah. Like I said earlier, the, the appeals court was given secret evidence too that, that we weren't able to see or confront or prove to be false and they didn't investigate it either. Just, they were just the same as the judge, three, three, three appeal judges. They got all sorts of secret evidence and when you read their decision, it makes no sense, but it was all based on the secret evidence too, but they didn't say that. This makes me not want to go to law school. <laughs> You should go to law school and, and be, like should, Kathy. be like Kathy. Be like Kathy. Okay, we'll see. I just have two questions. First, I want to thank you for making this film. And my questions go towards how were you able, because you can tell from those scenes and how you see the kids growing up, how were you able to finance and also motivate yourself to keep going and moving forward with, these project, with this project throughout all of these years? And then the second question is, what's the plan um, to ensure that it's distributed and seen by as many Americans and people uh, across the world as possible? So, um, uh, what I generally do is that instead of renting things, I'll just buy them. So I knew I, it would take me 10 years to make this film, so I bought a camera. And I just kept, you know, and I bought the editing equipment. So I bas literally have everything I need to, to make this film. Um, I bought it and then I, you know, that's how I financed it. Um, I cut down everything because I edit myself. Um, I do a lot of things myself. Oftentimes I'll do sound myself, so that's how I finance it. Um, my, my, my hope for this film was that perhaps it will get launched uh, through a festival. That, uh, maybe not even a top tier festival because this, this is not an industry uh, project. But, it, but a middle tier festival would, would, would take, take it. Well, no, no, because, because I think, I, 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 for the first time, I'm understanding how, how festivals work. They're industry things, so, so they, they promote whatever's in the industry. So I, I am somebody who's just like out of the blue, I, I've made this film, and, and they don't know what to do with a film like this. Um, I, I think ultimately I, uh, either this film will go through an aggregator, which, is, which are people who buy content for Prime, Netflix, and, and they, you know, they buy your film and they try to fill in the slots, or more likely than not, I would use Vimeo Video On Demand, which has a very lucrative contract uh, for the filmmaker. And as you can, you know, if, if the word gets out there, then certainly they can uh, recoup some of your investment. Hi, thank you again for uh, having this film, making it, and for all everybody's work on this trial and everything. I remember it from the beginning, too, and it's just been horrendous. So I don't understand why more Americans don't stand up against these kinds of injustices. I mean, we have a very large group of people in this area that have always stood up against it, and none of us have been thrown in jail. I mean, yeah, we've been, some of us have been arrested every now and then, but, you know, it's, it's just the fear is ridiculous. I think, and it, and it totally goes against what we are brought up believing that, you know, we're supposed to be living in this land of freedom and all that. But um, I was thinking when you were talking about the secret, well, when the film was talking about the secret evidence and, and we were talking about how complicated and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's exactly what happened with the Iraq war, right? The, the secret evidence, the, 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 the non-existent WMDs and everybody bought into it because of flag flying and fear. And it's, I just can't believe that we can be so stupid as a nation. And I've always wondered about that ever since the Vietnam War, you know? Um, so I just hope that we can somehow get this film out and get, you know, 
Let's get people to understand that this stuff is really happening and we need to all take part in protesting it and, you know, demanding. And now, you know, with the January 6th hearings, yes. yeah, <laughs> it's like we have met the enemy and they are us, right? <laughs> anyway, thank you again. I want to ask you a question, Larry. Oh, sure. So, 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 tell me about the informants. I, I know him as as I'm from Pakistan. Culturally, I kind of understand who he is. As somebody who's who's a who's a journalist, what have you found out about him, other than what is public? Is there something else you have another insight into him? Well, what I what I always found out was that he sort of was using his position as a, an informant, a celebrity informant, he was scamming people he knew all the time during this whole period. I mean, the second, as far as I could tell, the second he, you know, he was sent to Tennessee, um, uh, like, in a, you know, protection program, and even the things he was doing in Tennessee, he was, you know, and I can't, I can't tell how much the, the government knew about what he was doing, but literally the second he got from, back from Tennessee, he starts doing, trying to get in the, this scheme with these, these uh, gas stations. And because when you, you know, when you lease a gas station from some person, right? Like he did, um, you know, you pay this huge upfront fee and then you pay like rent and all this stuff. And so he was basically uh, negotiating with these owners of the gas stations, um, and then he, but then he would be like, well, then he would get someone else to pay the uh, the, the the fee for the gas station, the upfront fee. And, you know, he's ripping people off, and then you know, I wrote about how he was ripping off the boxer Amir Khan. Mm -hmm. And then and then there's other. I keep hearing all these stories. So it was like this. He was almost better at that than the being an FBI confidential witness, I mean, as far as I can tell, he was horrible at it. And that's what just make, that's what makes this all worse. It was like, and beyond it being all, all this stuff being hidden and everything, but he was just horrible. And he was, but it, it, was, it was like a con man. I mean, although at the end, you know, we talked, uh, Malik Riaz, his older brother, um, you know, I think he comes from this very uh, wealthy sort of feared family where he's from. So, but you know, I don't know that part as as well. But that's my sense. It's just this very complicated thing. I mean, you know, that that, that um, the place that was set up as the sting, the the initial one, that all state office in um, Latham. Latham is is my reporting. I mean, the guy who owned that also sold Shahed his first house back in like when he got here, like decade before even the case even started. So I, the other thing was I have a lot of questions like, what was he doing here? Um, was he here doing something on behalf of, you know, his, his uh, government? I just, I'm not sure. It, it's, it's all, I don't know if I'll ever get to the bottom of it, but you know, the, the, and I think there was ties to the, the, the FBI task force. Um, in Albany with, with the, that owner of those buildings and the guy who sold him his first house. So I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of questions. So uh, you probably don't know this, but you know, I listened to all the tapes and because I can speak Urdu, it was very easy for me. Um, Malik was so comfortable with get, being taped by the FBI that during one of his trips, he called his mistress up and he had a conversation that is taped and he's talking to her in Urdu, and it's quite clear in the way he's talking and who he's talking to that he was having an affair with this woman. And while he's on his way to Hussein's house to sort of get him into some sort of a conversation or something, I mean, that takes guts to just call up your mistress while the government is listening yeah. <laughs> on your conversation. Yeah. yeah. I hadn't heard that. But it's like he can't go one day without doing <laughs> something really shady or maybe one hour. It, <laughs> There's a never-ending trail stuff that you keep yeah. finding out about the more you dig. Yeah, I mean, and like the, the other thing is a lot of people told me, you know, his, he made all this money also you know, buying uh, expensive cars and then like torching them and then getting the, the insurance money because if you don't have credit or if you don't have a, 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 an account, a bank account or something like that, uh, the way to get cash is through an insurance company. They just cut you a check. 
you don't have to have any, you don't even have to have a bank account. So it was, that, that, you know, he was always behind the scenes. And one of the judges, I think it was the Newberg trial, had actually, uh, yeah. what, what, what did she do? Judge McMahon, well, he perjured himself every day on the stand during the Newberg trial about simple things that could be easily proven false, like, were you in court in Albany on a certain day? Did you have a lawyer? And he would just lie, like, and it was clearly, you know, he was lying, 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 so much that the judge wrote to the um, prosecutors up in Albany and said, well, I think he lied in his, because he had a bankruptcy proceeding in Albany during the time when he was testifying, well, he testified in Newburgh that the, um, what was her name, the, Benazar ben Buddha was Benji. giving him all this money, right? Oh God, she was, was the, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, yeah. that she was giving him all this money at the time, but really he had a bankruptcy case in Albany during that same time period, so the judge wrote to the prosecutors in Albany and said, kind of looks like he may have committed bankruptcy fraud or something, you know, he's definitely lying one way or the other. They did nothing, they didn't care. They used him again, you know, in the Khalifa case. Yeah, the bankruptcy case, I've, I've covered, you know, hundreds of bankruptcy cases, I've never seen one like it. There, there was no, there was, he, 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 it didn't appear he paid anyone. It didn't appear that it, it, it ended. It just sort of fizzled out. It, it was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. And his story is actually extremely interesting because when he came to uh, America in the, in the 90s, I think he came fairly destitute. And, and th in those days, uh, Pakistanis had found a way to go to Mexico and come into the country. His fortunes changed in the late uh, uh, aughts, uh, uh, maybe around 2005 or so. He, um, his brother became perhaps the Donald Trump of Pakistan, not politically, but in terms of, real, well actually Donald Trump is a terrible real estate developer, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but but, <laughs> but he, became a, he, be, he got into with, with the military and then the family got flushed. I mean, they're, they're one of the wealthiest families. So now he's back in Pakistan and he lives a, a high life and, and, and nobody can touch him. I mean, it's just, it's an amazing reversal of fortune for him. Yeah, he, he took off to Pakistan. He probably would have come back, been going back and forth if it wasn't for the fact of the limo crash and him having maybe some liability there, definitely some liability there. He left his son to face the criminal charges. He just was like, oh, I'm staying in Pakistan. You know, his son was taking direction from him on how to run the company and he's the one that, that had the charges, which he only got probation. I, I have this question for Larry. Um, here we are at the Sanctuary for Independent Media. Um, and independent media is a nice adjective to kind of put against the, what we call the MSM, the mainstream media. <laughs> but what you have done with your work, which has been amazing, we email each other and say, you see Larry's article today? He uncovered this, you see that? Wow, and that's how we keep getting our information from you. Mm -hmm. I guess I have a general question about kind of the, I don't wanna say the role of the media because that's kind of old and, and corny, but what, what we saw certainly in this case and what other families have seen and what other lawyers have seen and the many other hundreds of cases that um, have transpired like this around the country is that the government always has the upper hand because the government is the one who is bringing the charge and so they can call up the media and say, here we are, we've got this charge, we've got that charge and bang, that's what's in, you know, on TV, that's what's on the radio, that's in the print media. And I wonder, you know, given your role here, um, your Part, part, certainly part of the mainstream media. How do you think things can change to kind of not rectify, but at least even off the scales here? Do you think that's, that's possible with, with journalism, with you know, any, any kind of media? You know, um, when it comes to the federal government, it's just, uh, I don't know how I'm you know, supposed to get, get to the bottom of like the, the story when they, they are hiding all this, um, you know, information uh, about him that you know they like would allegedly share the with the judges. Um, so it's really tough as a journalist. I mean, what am I going to do? Like, I don't, I don't have. I'm not a lawyer. I don't. I mean, they might make some lawyers available to me to fight these kind of things, but they're very costly. Um, the 
the the way I sort of navigated this case was, you know, I read everything that was available in the cases that I could. You know, there's like literally on the electronic docket, there's like transcripts just missing, you know, from the case. So I always found lots of holes. So, but I would go to like the state and local level to find stuff about Shahed because he'd done so much stuff in the where he lived, like in the town of Colony, there was all these files that mentioned had all this stuff with him. Those, th those, those people in those offices don't have the same agenda as the federal government. I just asked for the, the documents and they gave them to me. They, it, they, they didn't care. And then, and then there's stuff like that. And then, you know, I would, there's stuff you could look at, like all these, um, I know there's gotta be a way to, uh, you know, all, anytime he like torched a car or something like that and got insurance money, there's a paper trail of that. Um, the fire uh, departments that respond, stuff like that. So I, I, it's, I feel, you know, for me personally in my position today, it's very, uh, like I, what am I supposed to do against the federal government? Um, I primarily get in through documents and then contact the people involved. If I'm, they could just get blank pages for the federal government. You know, like they did. Yeah. I mean, it's very, I don't think we have, a, I don't think we're like the Democrat leaders of democracy. We're like the worst people to like be in charge of it, democracy, the way I see it. You know, especially the federal government. I don't know what to do, but it's very disheartening. But I mean, um, you know, things like that, his documentary, his movie is so amazing. And, um, you know, I think he found, a lot of the truth, you could you could find it from not the government, but their victims, you know. And, and uh, you know, just to say about the print media, print media was still skeptical of from the from, uh, of the government's case from very early on. Um, not only Brandon, but also uh, Carl Strzok. I mean, these people questioned. Whereas I think the bigger problem was with the local news channels because I think they they, they appeal to a different instinct, and and it's it's more about. It's more theatrical, and they want the quick lines and the quick uh, hooks. So I think they are the ones who really dropped the ball, and they are the ones who were manipulated, and they are the ones most people watch. So unfortunately, that's worked to the government's advantage. One of the one of the most powerful things in the movie is that we can all recognize a lot of the spots. You know, we yeah, we've all driven that you know the the exit ramp into the into the plaza and. We know Albany, we, we're all local. I assume most of us here are local and we, and we know these spots and so therefore it's very, it's very personal. And, and what really seemed to happen here that perhaps didn't happen in a lot of other cases throughout the country and there have been some real horrendous, equally horrendous cases is that at least, as you say, Masood, and you're right, the print media um, was, without making a, a journalistic you know, uh, imbalance here, I think the, the print media was a lot more open to the other side, which was the side that certainly the, the victims and, and the support people were pushing every single day than perhaps in other areas. And I think without that, um, Things may have been a little bit different, and Albany was uh, was good in that respect. The print media took the time to go and interview these guys. You know, print media. Uh, Carl Strzok went down and spoke with uh, Yasin a few times. Uh, he, I think, he went to uh, Mohammed Hussein's uh, piece. So, so they took the time uh, to go and talk to them and 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 to get their perspective, which uh, I, I think that just the TV news just they just don't have that kind of. Uh, um, of time. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was that this is so funny that FBI was so concerned about this case and how it was being perceived by the public that they went, um, uh, Parachek, who was the lead prosecutor, and Timothy Cole, who was the lead FBI agent who actually orchestrated this entire s scenario, they went to Carl Strack's office in, uh, at the Gazette and demanded a meeting with his editors, and I have a picture of it with Carl and, and uh, uh, Parachek and, and Timothy Cole. What they were saying to him is that you, you, you are ruining our, our, our relationship with the Muslim community by printing this kind of uh, contrarian uh, storyline, 
And, and so he said to them, but I am not the one doing this. You're the one who's entrapping them, and, and you're the one who's arresting them. So, so you're the one who's destroying that relationship. My reporting is, is, has nothing to do with it, but it's a very funny picture of the two of them just really talking to him, and Carl is just kind of looking at them like, okay. Yeah, they totally tried to intimidate him, and then it backfired because he wrote a column about what they did. <laughs> and then <laughs> the other thing they did is they put to, they, they knew that the community was really upset about this, and so they made a PowerPoint presentation and invited like community leaders to try to show their side of it. And I didn't want to go there and see it. I, I didn't want to go there at all, but Lynn and Jean and some other people went there. Lynn, do you want to say anything about that briefly? Oh. Or? Well, it was, um, we did go, there were six of us, who, the um, FBI, when they want to crow about their, their wins, they, um, anyway, it's, a, it's kind of a long story, but I'll be very brief. We, we wound up with meeting with Tim Cole and um, uh, what I call a, a civil liberties attorney, civil liberties <laughs> attorney for the FBI named Paul Holstein. And there were six of us who went. and. We all actually had two meetings over the period of six hours over the whole thing. Um, I recorded the entire um, meeting. I still have the recordings. I'm going to put it on my website. I have it too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, even though, of course, I was out of the room when they said you can't record. So <laughs> what it, I didn't hear that <laughs> until I listened to the recording later. At any rate. Um, it was, it was very interesting. One of the women with us could speak Arabic fluently. She was from Iraq. And one of the very first things, this is, this is, how, this is how terrible the FBI is. So they called this, uh, this sting operation, they called it Operation Green Grail, right? So, which was bad enough. And then they had this whole PowerPoint. And when they started it, they, they used um, one, of the mus one of the surahs that um, my friend who spoke Arabic just loved. It was this beautiful surah. And I can't imagine, you know, that the FBI, if they, um, you know, wanted to go and entrap someone who was Catholic, that they would, you know, have, uh, you know, like, a, you know, that they would have a prayer, you know, a Catholic prayer and, a, and call it, you know, the the grail or the holy grail or something. I mean, to me, yeah, I, I, it just, it was so awful what they did from the very beginning. And one of the slides, one of the first slides, so my friend, her name is May, she looks at the slide and the, the, it was all in Arabic and, and the, the Tim Cole said, well, it says this. And then they flipped the slide and she says, wait a second, it doesn't, it doesn't in any way say that. It says something different. And of course she was, you know, very fluent. She, you know, she taught English as a second language, I think, at that and time. And Arabic, yeah. And Arabic. And so it just, um, they really wanted to convince us that they were right and that um, Yassin and Muhammad were, were guilty. I think that, I'll, I'll end with this brief story, but the best part of it was when um, I was with my friend, well, my friend Lucy came. And Lucy's like, well, I want to see, um, I want to see the, the trigger mechanism, because that's the mechanism that the FBI said that Yassin saw it, so he knew it was, you know. Well, he was counting the money. Well, he was counting the money. So um, first they brought down the, the shoulder fire, you know, the SAM, whatever that thing is, the missile. And um, so, and Lucy's like, no, no, I don't, I don't want to see the missile. I want to see the trigger mechanism. So Tim Cole, the FBI agent, says to the Paul Holstein, the FBI attorney, uh, Paul, could you go to my room and go get the trigger mechanism? And Paul Holstein says, I don't know if I know what it looks like. And we're like, <laughs> you, <laughs> it's like a staple gun. It, it's like, excuse, and we're all like, you wouldn't know. Like, and so Yassine is supposed to know what this thing is, and you don't know what it is. <laughs> like, forget it. At any rate, that was uh, quite an adventure. So good evening. Uh, I wanted to thank you for making this extremely important film. Um, it needs to be widely spread and seen. But as we were sitting in our chair, I said, I have to come up and speak to the family because we used to go to your pizza shop. And it really hurts to see what has happened. My daughter Nikita used to play with Sister Khadija and she used to go to your house, Sister Fatima. 
And I want you to know that our hearts are breaking with you. We love you. We pray for you. And I will do my best to see that this film gets seen by many. Because in the end, hopefully, Allah has the last say, yes? And hopefully, in the end, justice comes. It did come to this gentleman with the limousine. What goes around comes around, karma comes. But I hear you, and I saw how this film ended. Brother Muhammad, discouraged. Your family, as you said, broken. Let us hope and pray that you find unity and that you rebuild your family because it is not the last word. Allah has the last word, and he has not spoken. Yes? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Hamza, and uh, Masood, thank you for this masterful and magnificent project. Um, I know I'm not really good with text messages, so please forgive me for that. Um, and I want to also appreciate um, Larry. I've read some of your, um, your articles, not all of them, and Kathy and Lynn and Jean and everybody that's here today. I really appreciate all of you guys. I guess my question is that, does the government still think the juice is worth the squeeze? I mean, they kept, they kept uh, Shahid you know, on their payroll, and he ended up killing, not only destroying the people that they think is terrorists, I mean, they destroyed our lives and they're happy with it, but they also killed 19 American lives. Was it still worth the squeeze? Um, and the second thing is that, what does this mean for democracy here in America? Um, we, we're championing it all over the world. We have the biggest military industrial complex, people making money hand over fist while the rest of us are suffering. So um, as Americans, do we see um, light at the end of the tunnel, especially us as a resistance front? Uh, do we see that and um, you know, where, you know, where, where can we see this go forward? I guess that's my question. I think you're in for a rough ride, mister. <laughs> over the next... Uh, four to eight years, you're, this is gonna be rough for America. Wait till this election comes around. Mm. And it's, it's, it's not headed in, in our direction. We're not gonna be benefiting from it, uh, unfortunately. I, I don't mean to make fun of it, but if you've lived through the last four to six years, you know, that's the only way to survive uh, is to make fun of it. Uh, so I, I, I don't see any, any change. I, I'm, I hate to be so negative about this, but I, I just don't see any change. I think Muslim stereotypes have stuck and they will be exploited um, every so often, just like the coronavirus waves come and go, uh, something happens, there's an attack or something, it, it will you know, be in the news and all those things will happen again and then it will die down and will come up again. So I personally am not optimistic about it. Uh, I see, I, I agree, sadly, <laughs> but I also see hope in the young generation. I feel like they're coming up a lot more fair-minded or a lot more seeing, caring about diversity and not being Islamophobic and not being racist and actually like actively opposing those things. So I do see hope with that and the demographic changes of the country, but it'll take a while, you know, for, I think it'll be, and hopefully we won't have a civil war, I mean, uh, but um, I do see hope in the future, but not maybe in the next few years. And, and to your first part where you, where you talked about uh, um, justice and all that, if there was real justice in this world, I think um, Muhammad Hussein and Yasin Arab should be able to sue the FBI for conspiracy. Yeah. That's really <laughs> absolutely <laughs> the case. These, uh, Timothy Cole wrote a film script. He wrote a screenplay. I write screenplays. I know what screenplays look like. He wrote a screenplay, and then they filmed it, and then they brought it to the, to the jury. That's conspiracy. That's the very definition of conspiracy. And, and unfortunately, um, you know, it's not in the cards, but that's what justice would look like. Yeah, I think that's the, I think that's the scariest thing is that, um, that the government can do that to, to people. You could be set up because they want they want <clears throat> to expend you. So, 
um, you know, things like secret prisons, CIA, outright, all those things sure. just make me yeah. not be very hopeful at all. I don't even know if like, the, does the constitution even still exist? Are there like secret constitutions they're like these judges are operating off of that we don't know about? Those are the kinds of things that I worry about on a daily basis. So I'm not hopeful, unfortunately, but um, maybe, you know, I, maybe I'm just paranoid, but. The interesting, the interesting thing I've seen is that even despite everything that happened with the Albany community, myself along with a couple other youth that we have in the mosque, we actually reached out to the police department because they were looking to recruit people. And so we had the state, uh, state police and the local police there. And guess who shows up to the mosque? Timothy. Agent Timothy McCole. <laughs> Wait, when was this? Because he says he's doing like a totally, like white collar fraud cases now. He's not supposedly. Well, he was there. He was there ready to recruit. Yeah, the FBI. We're, oh, we're such amazing people. Yeah, right. And, uh, and it, wow. it really, it, it had a lot, he had a lot of gall to come into the mosque and say yeah. that. And we, when we asked him about it, like, you know, you destroyed two families' lives. You up, basically upended the entire Muslim community. No, he said, I did everything absolutely correctly. And yeah. then he came into our mosque looking for people, you know, to, uh, you know, to whatever. <laughs> Un yeah. Uninvited, yes, it was uninvited too. It was uninvited. Uh, so as a, as a Muslim community, um, you know, we, we believe obviously that hope and, and all those things, we believe in that, that eventually things will be balanced out and we're making that effort uh, towards that direction. So, um, you know, we're, we're doing our best at what we can with the broken pieces that we have, you know, and uh, we just hope that um, we keep pushing forward and not, you know, I mean, it's, it looks grim, but not to kind of give up. And um, for, for everybody that's here, um, I'm eternally grateful um, I'm probably not able to put in letters and stuff like that, but uh, please, on, my, on behalf of my family and Imam Yassin's family and everybody, thank you so, so much. Um, heartfelt gratitude. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you so much, Hamza. You know, you, you the, the, the kids of, of Mohammed and Yassin give me hope so much because there's, you guys are so wonderful. We love you so much, and we've watched you grow up. And, we, and also this community gives me hope, you know? If it hadn't been for you all standing up with the Muslim community and for Yassin and Muhammad, they would have been doing 30 years and they wouldn't be out. Um, so, you know, you gotta take the hope you can get and just keep trying. Um, I don't have a question, but I do have a lot of comments and a lot of things that I've absorbed. Um, First, I'm grateful for CCF to let me be part of their team so I can be part of this um, conversation. Um, Could you come closer to the microphone? Okay. I have a lot of emotions, so I'm going to try. I tried to get rid of them all on the chair, but um, they might come back. I wanted to thank all of you guys um, for, for this whole production, all the effort for the case, Kathy. Um, I wanted to personally thank you because being a Pakistani, um, it hit really close to home. I wanted to apologize to uncle that this happened to you. I felt like, um, you know, you're someone that I probably grew up with. I wanted to apologize on behalf of my community that probably hasn't been there in the way I would have liked for us to be there because Huck is supposed to be our existence. Huck means justice. I wanted to ask for advice um, because there is fear, there is not just fear, but there is complete rejection in wanting to get involved in social justice work in our community. Um, when we have um, Top Gun released, it becomes the top seller, and if you go to the masjid to ask them to screen witness, they won't do it. And so the youth is turned away. Um, how, do we, how do we deal with that? Um, what should we do? Um, because we would like to light this film up on fire. Um, some of us have come late to the game, but um, we're trying to make up for it um, because we need to. I know, especially as a Pakistani, um, I feel like when I look at um, the officer or the, the informant or the avenues used to entrap people in so many cases have been Pakistani people um, and it's heavy. Um, it's very heavy. I don't know why, but I didn't need to tr a translation to watch the film. I could have seen that this man is evil. 
uh, so many of the words he used, his gesture, his language, his whole demeanor. And that's why I feel like they keep us far away. Um, you know, the jury doesn't look like us. The, the people in charge, the people that uh, hand out, you know, sentences don't look like us because then you would understand. And then you have these words that make us look really mystical and, you know, crazy. So what do we do? How do we... Um, so one of the nice things about uh, coming here is that you know I'm a filmmaker who, who exists outside of the mainstream, so I have to discover my audience. Usually the, the, the audience discovers a filmmaker, I have to do the reverse process. So I have to come to people like you who, who can relate to this film, who can, who can see the deeper meaning of what this the film is trying to say. So, so go, go to my website, go to my, uh, uh, like the Facebook page, uh, put, post it on your, on your um, uh, feed. All those things, those little things help. When I, when I take this film to an aggregator, one of the first things they'll say, what is your social media presence? Uh, how many likes did you have on your Facebook thing? How many visits have you had? How many, how many people have seen your trailer? Um, those are things that, that, that you can negotiate. Uh, you can negotiate a better deal if you have solid data to back that up. So, so if you like the film and if you think it is meaningful, so please do share it. Share, write about it, talk about it. And, and uh, I, uh, once I go through this festival cycle, I, I'm very eager to just put it out there on video on demand, even for 99 cents a showing, um, and just move on and, and, and let this film exist in people's minds. Are there any other questions? So at the, um, what I'd like to do is maybe uh, wrap up with a comment with, maybe we'll start with Larry, if you have anything else that you'd like to, to say about the movie or your, your experience with Shahid Hussein and all of your research. No, well, well, research. We, we were just talking how, you know, we can't find him to talk to him. But, um, uh, but I, the, the movie was amazing, I, you know, I would, I don't, maybe, I don't know, because uh, I, um, you know, for the first time I just spoke in person to Muhammad, and, uh, you know, I think then seeing the movie and being a dad myself, it's crushing, you know, what he had to go through. Yep. And obviously I rough too. Um, but uh, the, the, the movie is uh, great because I don't, I, we haven't done that story, the follow-up. So the, to me, this is groundbreaking in the story. I learned a lot myself. I mean, you guys probably obviously knew more of this, but um, I just really appreciate it. I feel like it's, it, it really pushes the fo story forward in a, one of the most meaningful ways that the, the media has done. And, and to boot, it was just beautiful. <laughs> Would you like to talk about CCF yeah, and yeah, the I future? Just, and I guess I want to put a plug for the Coalition for Civil Freedoms because after the Araf Hussein case, Steve Downs and I and Lynn and Jean, we formed, and, and Shamshad Ahmad from the Masjid al Salam, we formed Project Salam in 2008. And then in 2010, we were part of the, especially Steve and I were part of the founding of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms, founded by a political prisoner who was unfairly charged and basically beat the charges, was under house arrest um, when he invited us down to his house. That's Sami Arlarian. And um, we went down there and we formed the Coalition for Civil Freedoms and we've grown over the last 10 years. We have family conferences where we bring together the family members of people as like a support group for each other and also to empower each other to stand up and speak about their loved ones. We have some family members from Massachusetts here whose son is in prison in one of these cases, Shelley and Stewart. Um, we have a lot of the CCF people here um, in the back there, and we have the table. We, we, yeah, we have the family um, conferences every year. It got kind of um, stopped by the pandemic, but we're hoping to have one this fall. Um, we support about 200 active prisoners. Some are serving life sentences and are totally innocent. Um, and we sometimes do some actual representation of them, or, or we just advocate for them, write letters for them, do what we can for them and um, give them a gift every Ramadan in their commissary account. A lot of them have no support. Um, so we could use lots of support. And we, um, we also published a report showing that most of the cases that the US calls uh, domestic terrorists, or not domestic, they call them domestic, but they're, they're bas basically Muslims. They're not the people that you call domestic terrorists now. Like, um, anyway, it, we published a report showing that of those Muslim cases, almost all are fake cases. There's, 
almost no real cases, and we have the report back there. Um, our website is civilfreedoms.org, and we could use lots of support, and we're gonna be um, pushing this movie on our social media a lot now, too. Um, also, I, I do want to acknowledge that the Hossein family is here, and it's so wonderful to see you all, and uh, Yassine's daughter is here, and it's so wonderful to see you, and I really appreciate that um, you've really changed my life meeting all of you, so thank you. And of course, I need to give the last word to our wonderful, wonderful filmmaker who made this movie that I learned. I, there are things that I didn't know that are in this movie, which I, I'm just so impressed. So thank you so much. You get the last word. So I, I just want you to, to think about this idea that we live in a country, perhaps the wealthiest country in the world, where the state's resources are used by bureaucrats to come up with plots to entrap people. I mean, it is mind-boggling to me with all the problems the planet has and, and, and we have, our democracy has, that you would take these kinds of resources and you would invest them in, in, in the lowest form of law enforcement. And outside of, I may be wrong in this, but I'm gonna make the statement anyway. Outside of United States, I don't think they do sting operations. I, I, I don't think, and there's anywhere else in the world where, where people sit around saying, what should this guy say to this guy that the jury will just buy it? And this is the level at which they did this. So it's a, it's a frightening thought for me that they're, that, that, you know, I would say defund FBI. Oh, don't, don't put that on the table. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you so much, Sanctuary for Independent Media, for showing the movie tonight and inviting us. <laughs>